I am so grateful for our friends at Blue Microphones. Not only have they completely changed what our show sounds like, they've given me headphones so I can monitor things better. This is the mic for millions of creative people, and now I know why. I'm so grateful for them completely changing the quality of our audio. You'll find Blue Mics like Yeti and the mouse, which we're using here, both in pro studios and home studios all literally all over the world. Their popular Yeti caster is a blue Yeti microphone plus a boom arm system that's behind many of your favorite podcasts. I see run into them all the time and now I know why. If you've ever thought about creating your own podcast or YouTube channel, Blue can make you sound and look great. Just visit bluemic.com and click get started and you can start telling your story. Hey everyone, it's a dose of Dr. Drew. It is indeed. And I was just telling Susan, I hear dog breathing behind me because there he is down there. <laughs> uh, I looked up and you were gone. Yes, I was uh, <laughs> playing with the dogs. And then I pulled my headset out because I couldn't hear myself. So, okay, I want to, I need a... I need a sound check from the uh, world out there. With How's Drew. the sound? Uh, Peggy <laughs> says uh, she saw the article in the LA Times today about fluvoxamine for COVID. And uh, she's uh, excited because I've been talking about it quite a bit here. And uh, today particularly was very helpful for me because I, I, didn't, I didn't have the sinking feeling I normally get. And when I took my second dose of COVID, I could feel only the sort of benefits because I wasn't as tired as I normally am. But anyway, it sounds good, Susan. So let's go to our guest, shall we? <laughs> right. Hold on one second. Let me move oh, all the banners yet. out of the way. Look at all that great Twitch response. Thank you, Twitch. We, we are fascinated with the world you live in over there and have been sending some of our YouTube people over there because we are not sure if YouTube is going to deplatform us or whatever. So we're trying, we're trying <laughs> to behave. But uh, my now, goodness. I, I've been told that we may not be, but I don't know. We'll see. We don't know. God, there's so much junk on the table. Look at that. There's a pile of stuff there, and I can't cut it out of the screen. Uh, Can you move it? This? Yeah, all that stuff over right. in the – that side. Okay, just push it up. That's better. Thanks. Okay. I'm not moving this. My <laughs> eye wand. I didn't notice that. Okay, here we go. Is, is it is the eye wand drdrew.com slash eye wand? Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, okay, everybody. So let's bring our new guest in. Uh, we not new. Our guest that has been a, a privilege to speak to him before in this stream, Dr. Thomas Yadigar. He's a pulmonologist, director of the intensive care unit at Cedars Provident Tarzana Hospital. He has been uh, embracing a new FDA technology with lower mortality rates and hospital time. And he and I have been uh, communicating over the last. I guess it's been close to a year. He was one of the first to sort of identify some of the markers associated with the cytokine storm and came up with interesting improvisational responses to help people survive the COVID storm. Dr. Yadigar, thank you for coming in. Hi, Dr. Drew. Good afternoon. Good to see you. So uh, tell us, uh, and where should we start the conversation? Should we start with what we've learned since we last talked about cytokine activation syndrome or should we go right to these newer, these newer interventions? I think we can go through it again. I know okay. that um, we've had a lot of ups and downs with it over the past year. I know that there's some <laughs> NIH trials that uh, unfortunately weren't done on the correct patients and didn't show the, the correct outcomes. Right. But, but we have been treating it aggressively. It happens to about 20 to 30% of our hospitalized patients. So it's not a small amount of patients that develop it. And these are the patients that unfortunately get super sick and need to go into the ICU and end up on ventilators and unfortunately have a very high mortality if you don't treat them early enough and aggressively enough. Meaning, again, th this is where the controversy starts to kick in. What, what, do we, what do we mean when we say early and aggressive? What are we talking about? When and with what? So um, obviously we don't treat every patient that comes in with COVID-19 into the hospital with these therapies. Mm -hmm. If you are on oxygen um, and you're on what we call low flow. So if you're on two, three liters, then the standard of care currently is remdesivir um, for a five day protocol, as well as dexamethasone, six milligrams once a day uh, for 10 day protocol. The problem is that these patients don't stay on low flow. The patients that develop cytokine storm, they develop a very rapidly progressive respiratory failure. And there are some hallmarks of the disease, which I think unfortunately, even after a year is still really being underdiagnosed and definitely under treatment. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that happens is this disease, this part of the syndrome happens in the second week of the illness. So the patients that are in the hospital have been sick at home. They've had symptoms for seven to 10 days, some even 
you know, more than two weeks. And that's when this autoimmune process, this cytokine storm happens. Let, let me, the- let me, I want to stop you if you don't mind. <clears throat> I'm going to use my case as sort of a interesting example of um, this phenomenon because I'm, I'm acutely aware that if you get into trouble with that, if you're not, I, as I, when I was sick, so I was sick for roughly three weeks, I'm still having sort of post long hauler stuff, a lot of neurological things and some shortness of breath and pulmonary symptoms. And when I was in the flu piece of the, of the illness, um, I felt like I had the flu. I was really nothing out of the ordinary about it. In fact, in fact, I thought to myself at the time, man, I had H1N1. That was worse. H1N1 as a flu was much more toxic. I was, I was much sicker with that. But I got sick on Thursday night. Monday morning, it's now four or five days in, that was when I finally tested positive. Was, I was negative until the fourth day in, which is also not that unusual and further, you know, complicates who we intervene on and when, right? Um, but by Monday, I was starting to notice shortness of breath. I wasn't desaturating. My uh, O2 saturation was around 94%. Uh, it was not perfect, but it was holding. And um, and I could feel more neurological stuff, like I was out of it. Like sort of, I wouldn't call it a full encephalopathy, but I definitely was not fully present. Now... I started steroids like the next day. What do you think about that? I think obviously that's one of the controversial parts because the study that did show um, where there's benefits to steroids in terms of decreasing mortality, it also showed that the patients who are not on oxygen don't benefit from it. But one of the problems with that study is, again, it treated every patient who came into the hospital with COVID-19. Right. That's not who you need to be treating right. with steroids. I think actually right. we're over treating a lot of patients with steroids because again, there's about 20 to 30% of the hospitalized patients that develop the syndrome. And those are the ones that we should really be treating with steroids. Well, I, I had immediate improvement. I, I noticed immediately that, uh, that I had a little bit of air trapping and hyper expansion and, and that was all kind of better. Um, but I was still not, I was still kind of progressing. I was still, you know, I could tell that I was still on a slope going the wrong direction, uh, even though it, 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 it slowed it, and maybe even halted it a bit. Next thing I did was uh, two days later, got a monoclonal antibody. And that really made a difference. It literally made a difference during the infusion. I felt, I felt it during the infusion. And that kind of, from then on, I was sort of stable. I, the slope was no longer negative. I was sort of stable for about another week. And then I slowly got better over the next week. Um, it isn't I, for me, as I thought about the treatment I got, that was a great way to stay out of the hospital. It seemed to be early steroids, bamlanivimab, watch the saturation. And we save a we save a hospital bed that way. And maybe my kidneys, because who knows what remdesivir would have done to me, you know? Um, what do you think about that? I think the monoclonal antibody infusion is amazing and it should be used as early as possible. I yeah. prefer within the first five days if, yeah. if possible. Yeah. The Agreed. difficulty obviously has been to try to get patients into the infusion centers, which are done in hospital setting. Yeah. And that's been a difficult part about getting it. But well, I think it uh, it, locally here, the, uh, the group called Coram, which is the CVS, uh, brought in, a, signed up, an infusion nurse showed up at my door with all the equipment and that was it. Done at home yeah i think within the past few weeks it's become much better but if you went back to early january and even even late january it's still very difficult to get it and it still took you know many days crazy that's crazy that's that's uh, that to me i just shake my head when i when i hear that and i have embraced using steroids in outpatients and i think again the day five that's the that's the key day for me um, if this is just a viral illness, if this is just a bad head cold, usually by day five, you've turned around, but if you're progressing by day five, and that's what I tell all the patients, you need to have an evaluation and you need to have other interventions. That, that was exactly what happened to me. So, so I was sick on Thursday, but going down on Monday. So Tuesday is when I started steroids. So day, exactly day five. Um, and, and again, I could feel the, the benefit, but again, that's, that's, that's the outpatient management. If somebody progresses or doesn't get the convenient treatments that keep them out of the hospital, you see them progressing, desaturating. Could they show up at the hospital? What do you do then? So typically, again, we start with the remdesivir and the dexamethasone. The remdesivir, if they've been sick for less than 10 days. The dexamethasone, if they're on low flow oxygen, we just give them the six milligram dose. 
But if they progress and they start needing more and more oxygen, if they go to five liters to seven liters, then what we do is we increase the dexamethasone. So we'll take it up to 10 milligrams BID. Or oh, wow. That's a TID. lot. That's a lot. It is. Yeah. It is. But that's what it really takes to yeah. stop the storm. Interesting. And again, as early as possible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help to get them on a ventilator. By then, it's too late. Well, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm fascinated by that. I didn't realize you guys were doing that that much. But I remember thinking, God, I wish I could take more dexamethasone. <laughs> I actually wanted more, which is kind of interesting. Well, you know, our, our treatments are really um, guided by up to date in terms of how we treat cytokine release syndrome due yep. to other illnesses. Yeah. And if you look, you know, one of the early hallmarks is to give dexamethasone and even up to 10 milligrams QID for the patients that are having severe syndrome. Wow. Interesting. We, we try we try to limit it to a, as little as possible. But if the patient is progressing, then, you know, that's when we up the steroids. And if they're not, if they're not improving or if they're getting worse still, then that's when we initiate the IL-6 therapy with tocilizumab. All right. So tocilizumab is your, is your next, next in line, right? Yeah. God, so I, someone I, goes, I had a patient who, well, a friend, a family member of a, of a surgeon who I was you know, communicating with. And I tried to get, this was out East, like in Virginia or something. And I was trying to get the intensivist to use tocilizumab or I was trying to get the surgeon to tell the intensivist. So it was sort of third hand stuff. He would not use toxilizumab. I was shocked. What What's the resistance there? Well, unfortunately, again, some of the trials that came out with the NIH showed that there wasn't a survival benefit. There wasn't a mortality benefit. And unfortunately, those trials were done on the wrong patient population. And actually, the very patients that they excluded in those trials, the people who are on 7 to 10 liters and progressing, right. those are the ones that we have actively been searching for and we've been actively treating for the past 12 months. Mm. Those are the ones that really benefit. And unfortunately, those were the ones that were excluded in the trial. And, and you're seeing benefit from that? 100%. If you get to them, again, you know, once they get to 40, 50% and they're progressing, that's when you want to start initiating it. Once they're on high flow, that's when you want to initiate it. And you also have to give them enough of a dose. So of, we use of eight, toxilizumab. Of toxilizumab. Interesting. Yes. Sometimes one dose is not enough. We, we prefer to use the eight milligram per kilogram dose and reevaluate the patient in eight to 12 hours. And if they still have not improved, then we'll give them a second dose. And so now we're on high dose of steroid, uh, oxygen support, you know, whatever that means. Do you, do you get into positive pressure oxygen as well? We do. We try to prevent them from ending up on a ventilator. Yeah. So if, if high flow doesn't do it, and then we use BiPAP uh. um, therapy. Uh, anything to prevent them from ending up on a ventilator. Once you put them on a ventilator and you give them positive uh, intrathoracic pressures, it seems like it, it's pouring fuel on a fire, and it really you know causes the process to get much worse. Which historically we we always got. It's funny with ARDS, which is one of the features of uh, COVID. We think it's ARDS anyway. I don't, I don't know that it's a traditional acute respiratory distress syndrome, but we used to always say that a certain amount of pressure help reduce maybe some of the fluid filling, the alveolar filling of ARDS. But if we didn't hit that pressure just right, we made it worse. Is that still the belief or is it just, it all makes it worse? Um, in in COVID-19 with acute lung injury, and I, I don't think it's typical ARDS, mm. at least in the initial stages, um, it definitely seems to make it all worse. So let, let me ask you prefer... something. Something that just occurred to me I'd never thought of before because you're framing it as lung injury. Does the ARDS that follows a near drowning get worse with uh, positive pressure? You know what no. I'm saying? Is it the same kind of energy or is this a very different kind of in injury? This is a much different injury. Yeah. Um, it's not the same as ARDS with pancreatitis or ARDS or even, you know, large transfusions. Got it. Um, this is this is almost kind of ARDS in slow motion. So although it meets the definitions of acute lung injury on day one, mm. you don't typically see all the other hallmarks of ARDS until two weeks into, you know, ventilator support. And That's by hallmarks, you mean the hypoxemia or do you mean the chest X-ray changes? The chest X-ray changes yeah. and, uh, um, and the high peak pressures, that, uh, yeah. go, the, the poor compliance. Right, right. Wow. Okay. So now we're, we're giving respiratory support, you know, by various means, trying to avoid intubation. We're on high dose steroids, toxilizumab. Anything else? Well, I think one of the things that I, we talked about is increasing the anticoagulation. So initially patients are on 
prophylactic doses and we do increase the anticoagulation. And I think one of the things that really works remarkably well is, is prone ventilation and also starting that as at the earliest stage possible. So everything why, why, is- Why do we think that works? Do we have any theory about that yet? Well, I, I personally do have a theory. I know yeah. that the theory in the literature is that you're recruiting alveoli, you're changing the diaphragmatic motion and you're helping, you know, um, better, uh, less shunting and better, um, better supported airways. But I think there's even more to it than that. In the, in the infiltrates that we see, I think those are infiltrates, those are the nidus of infection for the cytokine storm. So what's happening is those areas where you have white, white cell counts that are releasing cytokines, and then you're gonna have more white cells that are recruited to that area, more inflammatory cells. And it's just, a, it's essentially kind of a self-feeding prophecy. Mm -hmm. So just a positive feedback loop. But once we, once we do the prone ventilation, now you're changing the, you know, the blood supply to those areas. So now those inflammatory cells are less likely to get to those areas and to, to further the process. Mm -hmm. I think by changing the body position, you're actually cutting this, you know, the cytokine storm, you're cutting the supply. Interesting. The, the process. Interesting. <clears throat> and as far as anticoagulation goes, I, I've been reading a bit about these, what are called nets, these neutrophil clusters, uh, and that they may be a major source of the clotting phenomenon. I guess I, I, I've never really heard of that before COVID. Uh, and that they, some literature I've read suggests that that might be one of the reasons the traditional anticoagulants aren't as effective as we expect them to be. Is there anything to that? Uh, I think there's definitely uh, an element. This is unique to COVID that we don't see with other disorders, other infections. Um, and I think anticoagulation is definitely important in these patients. And there is microthrombi that we're not even seeing on Dopplers or other tests. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the active four trial did come out and did show that there was a benefit. And again, it's, it's in the moderate uh, patients with moderate yeah. to severe disease, not the ones that are critical and on the ventilators. That, that's more, I actually, people asked me if I worried when I was sick, that was the only thing I worried about was the, the coagulation issues and could you get strokes and just, it's the only thing that's the sort of, to me, that's the capricious, most capricious aspect of this illness because it doesn't necessarily only happen in the severely ill, right? No. Yeah. No, it happens at any, it happens at any part of it. And again, I think it goes hand in hand with the hyperinflammatory response. And I think the thing that people still don't understand is that what makes COVID so unique and so deadly, it's it's really two disorders, right? So you have the viral syndrome and yeah. that in and of itself is bad enough to kill especially the elderly, the frail, the people with underlying heart, lung, kidney conditions, cancer. But then on top of that, you get this autoimmune process that happens in the second week of the illness. And that's usually what's affecting the 40 to 60 year olds, the people with diabetes, obesity, that seems to be really the driving factor um, for those patient populations. Yeah, I, I definitely was in that camp. Uh, do, do we know what that is, these these neutrophil clusters? Is there, I don't, I don't know what that physiology is, because then, because if I guess we knew, we could know what to do to, to reduce it. I guess steroids are probably helpful. Is there anything else? Um, I think, again, you know, early steroid intervention. Yeah. And I think, you know, probably if you would have taken a little bit more steroids, you probably would have gotten better faster. Mm. Um, and I think there is a role to, to steroid therapy for outpatients. But again, it's the patients that are having this hyperinflammatory response. Um, not for everyone and certainly not early in the disease. Somebody's asking what, what was it we were talking about with the chest X-ray that was atypical for ARDS. You know, ARDS is a, is a alveolar filling through you get these fluffy diffuse infiltrates everywhere. But what is different in COVID? So for a typical ARDS patients, and we saw this in tons of patients with H1N1 when they had, uh, you know, severe respiratory distress, it usually happens within the first three to five days of the illness. And you don't need to be a radiologist. You could be standing across the room. Right. What will happen is the, the lungs will just essentially show up as white. Yeah. Everything shows up as white. Yeah. Versus with COVID, it's more of a what we call an interstitial disease infiltrates. And it's kind of rapidly, slowly progressing to ARDS. And if you don't prevent it in two to three weeks, it will look like the same picture as that patient with H1N1 in two to, that had in two to three days. I'm reading some of the, the uh, questions here on the thread to see if anybody wants specific questions from you. So um, have you tried uh, some of the other cytokine interventions that are out there like Laronlimab? 
Um, we tried to get it. Um, there was one patient where I did get FDA approval for emergency use. Unfortunately, by the time that it was delivered to our institution, um, the, it was kind of too late for the patient and the mm -hmm. family just with, you know, withdrew therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that, again, every one of us has a different immune system. So it's not unusual that one medication would work for a lot of people, but not for 100%. That's right. true. And I think at the end, you know, there will be two or three different medications that we'll have to use to suppress the immune system and um, to solve the, you know, the problem of the cytokine storm. So there's an interesting, you, you may not have an opinion about this, but I've been sort of ruminating a little bit about this. There's not a literature yet on this, but whether or not an excessively, not even excessively, a very exuberant antibody response has something to do with all this. Um, I had my, I had this thing called an additic score. I had my, I had my antibodies checked and I was almost 50, 10 or 15 times the level of the vaccine recipients that I was measured against. And I had multiple antibodies to multiple viral proteins, but my spike proteins, particularly my spike protein antibodies were like 170,000 while a vaccine recipient is like 15,000. Is there anything to that or we don't know any correlations with that yet? I think a hundred percent that has a strong um, correlation with uh, the inflammatory response. And if you look, I think there was a virologist who really early on um, went over why this happens. And one of the things that happens with COVID is that in this, terms of the spike protein, there's this regional binding domain, the RBD, and that's what attaches to the ACE receptors. And I'm getting a little technical, but I think yeah. it's important because unlike other viruses, unlike other infections, in terms of SARS-CoV-2, it exposes that area much earlier than it needs to. And by exposing it, because it's such an antigenic uh, region, it causes this huge, you know, antibody response. And unfortunately, I think that antibody response in the subsegment of patients that have this syndrome, whether it's long haulers, whether it's the cytokine storm, that's what really triggers it and initiates it and prolongs it. Th that's kind of what I was thinking is the only thing, I mean, just, you know, it's just correlation at, the, at this point, but I was thinking, wow, I have this crazy antibody response I also had a you know a pretty exuberant inflammatory response, and I'm having long hauler stuff now. I wonder if there's something going on there. Do we know what the physiology might be in that? Um, I think again, it's the fact that the virus exposes this really highly antigenic area before it binds to the receptor. And most other viruses, most other infections, they, it's very late stage, and the body doesn't really have time to respond to it. In this virus, it exposes it at a much earlier stage. And by doing so, it initiates this, you know, huge antibody response. And I mm -hmm. think that there was a recent study by some um, researchers in Stanford, Dr. Utz, who commented on the fact that patients with COVID-19 do have a very significant antibody response. And that can correlate with the cytokine storm. Interesting. But we don't know how those antibodies are triggering that, really. We don't. We just yeah. know that I think this is what triggers the antibodies and then, you know, why it happens. I think the next step we haven't learned yet, but I think I think it's not too far from the imagination. If you have a thousand or 10,000 antibodies, it's entirely possible that one or two of those antibodies may be to your cardiac muscles or one or two of those may be to your brain cells or to your alveolar cells. Right. And that's what's maybe initiating the, you know, the nidus for the right. I, let's remember, I'm at 150,000. I almost wonder if it's causing cross-hatching with the neutrophils or something. Maybe that's how the the uh, small vessel damage happens. Well, I think the you know T helper cells are probably very important in that because you know that's one of the cells that's probably initiating and driving at least the cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, I think we're going to know more, unfortunately, because this virus is going to continue to infect more people. And we're going to have to continue to, to learn more about it. I, I wish they would do more education uh, to help people stay out of the hospital in terms of how to use telemedicine and what, how to ask for treatment. And I, you know, I, the, the other, the other frustrating part is not just the patients knowing what to ask for and how to use the medical system, but our peers don't seem to be using aggressive measures in the outpatient setting almost, I mean, rarely. 
Yeah, I literally within the past hour, I got off the phone with a patient who um, had been calling our office because their primary care doctor was just telling them to take Tylenol and they've been having fevers for 10 days. Yeah. And we finally said, no, this isn't normal. It may be the virus, but it may be other things. And Oof. we sent him in and got it tested and he had a bacterial, a secondary bacterial infection. Oh my God. So we put him on antibiotics and um, otherwise he's like, I've been just suffering. So I, I agree with you. I think we've really failed um, both to inform the public and then also within our community to inform each other. Because I think a lot of people are still not, even after a year, we're still not treating this virus the, with, with the intensity that we need to. Now, I, what the, the more controversial areas is sort of the very early treatments where we don't really have anything that certainly it stands up to a randomized placebo control study. But in some countries, they are using ivermectin. Yes, I mean, I think ivermectin, colchicine, as there are some articles about colchicine yep. and, you know, um, as well as the antidepressant um, therapy. I think all those, I, I don't have any problem with them. I think, again, if someone's getting worse after five, day five, I think they should be evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't initiate that therapy early on in the disease process because that's still in the viral you know, stage. I can tell you, fluvoxamine is helpful. It's really helped me. And, um, you know, if I could have started earlier, I probably w wish I had because it, it, it's distinctly helpful. I, I have, you know, I have um, what I would only describe, I have a weird sinking feeling and fatigue and I have sort of, I had mental fogginess, but that's not really the problem right now. It's more of mentally, f I fatigue. I get to the point, like after about an hour of conversation, I, I just have to stop and go lie down. That's just it. Um, and and I have, it gets mean. And I have some personality <laughs> changes, and I have terrible ringing in my ear. All that got better with fluvoxamine. But and, he's always and, nice, so it's hard when he's mean. It's and, just when unusual. It, and when it wears off after about six hours, I am quite aware of it. I'm aware of it. So it's kind of interesting. I, I don't not you know they, there's all this theory that it's the sigma one receptor where it's having its effect, but I, you also aren't able to like go running. No, I can't run. No, it's no. the weirdest thing. No way. Like he used to run all the time, and now yeah. I can't. No. But I think the fatigue is not unusual. I mean, I, I, after an influenza, after H1N1, after usually a lot of other infections, you know, the fatigue is the last thing to get better. Um, the lack of energy and the fatigue could take weeks and even a month after a severe infection. Yeah. So I think that aspect of it is not unusual. But if the medication helped, then that's amazing. Yeah, because uh, it, was, it was more than it, it was sort of an uncanny feeling that I had. And again, the irritability and the personality changes and stuff. It, and and I and I had trouble assessing, you know, I, I felt like my cognition was intact, but again I had I had trouble being objective about it. You know, I think Susan a couple of times you told me I was repeating myself or something. And well you were just behaving like I usually do. <laughs> so forgetting stuff. So you yeah, go, was, I well, told you I that you, and I'm like, I, I don't remember. I, I, you know what I had was a very striking I, I tell you this was one of the most striking symptoms I had neurologically. I couldn't follow sequences. If, if Susan came in and said, uh, I need you to get this coffee, put some cream in it, grab your pen and write a note, I would have just said, I know you're talking to me. I have no idea what you told me. I know. And you I forgot go, to put your suits out for the dry cleaning today, yeah, I know, too. I know. I asked you to uh, do that. I, I decided I didn't have any. <laughs> But, oh, okay. but doesn't doesn't that happen to most men after like about ten years of marriage? Don't <laughs> that, that, that's it's not a, a normal that, process. That, that, that was it was not. But then it's not specific to to lists to, to sequences. This was specific to sequences. He reminds me weird. a little more of my son who has ADD. Like you would tell him to do something, and then he would just totally not do it. And that's not Drew's normal. Yeah, no, I, I had trouble responding to text. I had trouble responding to emails. I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't. Yeah, I everything couldn't was overwhelming. I guess overwhelming. It was just very, very, very strange. And again, a lot of that, that's pretty much gone now, thank, thankfully. And I think that's the brain fog that, you know, we hear. And I have, you know, half a dozen patients with the, that are long haulers that have that. And it's difficulty concentrating and um, difficulty with tasks, you know, even the even tasks. mundane tasks. Yeah, the tasks is the main thing. I, I, I don't feel foggy, but doing things, initiating things, completing things, was very very challenging. Now, I feel like that's that's a bit better. Get better. Um, budesonide. Any any uh, opinion about that? Um, we used it. We used it early on in hospitalizations in terms of inhaled therapy. Um, I, I think again maybe early and before hospitalization. I think uh, once they are hospitalized, it's probably not effective enough. It's not right. enough of a steroid right. um, because it's inhaled. Um, 
And again, if you're comparing it to 10 milligrams of decadron, you know, dexamethasone, DID or TID, right. budesonide, right. 0.5 milligrams is not going to make a difference. Right. And, and do you think the budesonide, is there anything about the budesonide, budesonide that's special or just any, you know, inhaled corticosteroid? I think the one thing about budesonide is that it is nebulizer, so it's a much more effective way of getting it into the into the lungs. Um, the other ones, in terms of in the typical inhalers, I know a lot of patients have a hard time using them. Even the you know inhalers like Adver, which are pretty simple to use, but I think just a nebulizer form is just a more effective way of getting the medicine into the lungs. About a week ago, I was having some more hyperexpansion. I was kind of short of breath. I couldn't drive without having my windows open. And I had some Dulera sitting around, and I used that for three doses. It improved a lot. One one puff, three doses over th- once Dr. a day. Dr. Yadigar looks concerned. Three, well, it just it, <laughs> it was lying around. It helped me a lot. It really helped. She's me. like got this this big drawer full of stuff. It's yeah. like <laughs> any any issues with that? I do something wrong, but it really helped me. <laughs> Well, I, I think, again, doctors are the worst patients. And, you know, <laughs> yes. How dare you? We, we should not, the last thing we should be doing is treating ourselves because we usually do a very poor job of it. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad that you're on the mend and I'm glad that, you know, everything is getting Everything else I did only under direction. So it's just, I was like, I think my Casale cured you. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, my recommendation would be to listen to Dr. Susan. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, how about uh, RLF 100 of uh, av- Aviptadil? Any opinion about that? I have haven't that? had any personal experience with it. Right. Um, but I think, again, you know, we're clearly not where we need to be with this disease, and there's still a lot of patients that are unfortunately dying unnecessarily. So, oh. you know, we need to have more medications to, to be able to use. Now, last time we spoke, it was kind of interesting. You, you were adhering to clinical pathways much more uh, specifically, but this was, I guess we talked like about four or five months ago and you were saying, well, this, this was our pathway and this, this was our clinical protocol and that's what we did. It feels like now you're expanding that a little bit. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yes. Uh, over the past five, six months, we have definitely expanded. And again, part of it was to treat the patients at an earlier stage. I would love to give the tocilizumab, uh, at five liters or seven liters, but unfortunately, you know, it's one, it's super expensive. Mm-hmm. And uh, two is I don't really have, it, it's much easier to give to someone who's on high flow. I think it's much easier to justify it. Uh, so that's why we started with the increasing the dexamethasone. And again, if you go into up to date, that's how cytokine release syndrome is being treated and the, you know, the guidelines for it. So we just try to adapt it to these patients that are having cytokine storm due to COVID-19. Uh, the, that, that's the IL-6 inhibitor, right? Uh Yes, the tocilizumab yeah. is the IL-6 in, inhibitor. In, the one you, that, there was some data now with uh, interferons, right? That's an, a recent set of publications. There was uh, inhaled interferon beta. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think that, that has panned Not out much. yet. I know, that, yeah, I know that that was early on in, I think, April or May that came out. That, okay. you know, and that was a small study. Okay. And then going to antivirals, uh, there was a, some preliminary stuff out of Israel that we all don't know is real, not. I guess they're going into phase two with that. And Maravarok has been uh, talked about here and there. Where, where are we with those things? Again, unfortunately, we don't have access to it because we don't do any of the clinical studies mm-hmm. in our institution. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, again, you know, there's clearly more medications that are necessary. What we have currently is not, you know, enough for to treat all the patients that are developing uh, and dying from this disease. As you look down, I, I, I imagine, well, I don't know if you do this or not, but as you sort of think about what you want to be doing next, are there things on your radar? Like as you, as you expand your protocols further, are there things you're thinking, hey, we ought to think about including this or we ought to you know, look into something else? Is, is that something you're thinking about? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, if you look at the way that this virus kills our patients, so one is the direct effect of the virus and just, you know, causing our elderly and frail patients and going into multi-system organ failure. So if there was antivirals to initiate that therapy early, to use the monoclonals as early as possible and, you know, to treat the patients before they progress. Yeah. 
So I think one is antiviral therapy and to, to decrease the viral load and, and to try to save our patients that way. Yeah. And then the second, second one is the anti-inflammatory disease to treat the, you know, the patients that develop this autoimmune part of the, of the syndrome. And that will be with steroids, with IL-6 inhibitors and possibly other you know, interleukin inhibitors, things to suppress the cytokine mm. um, storm. Interesting. Um, I was speaking to a uh, virologist, epidemiologist yesterday who was, who was concerned that some of the mutations or the variants, so-called, are going to make some of the molecular antibodies less effective. In fact, he had some specific data about bamlanivimab that concerned me a little bit. Uh, do you have any update on that or any knowledge about that? I think, again, if you look at the South African and potentially even right. the Brazilian, yes, not so those, much the UK. Yes, those are the two. Those are those two variants. Yeah. Um, you know, they are causing a lot more infections in people that were already infected. So that tells us that the antibodies that were produced by, you know, natural immunity are probably not effective anymore, which would probably be extended to the other, you know, engineered antibodies. Yeah. Whether it's the Eli Lilly or the Regeneron product. Yeah. But... You know, I mean, I think if you look at it, this virus has been around for at least a year now, and we've already seen it mutate and have four to five different variants. Mm. What we need to do is a much more aggressive vaccination yeah. because the longer this virus yeah. stays on our planet, yep. the more it's going to mutate. So people ask me, you know, is it going to be over when we vaccinate 360 million Americans? You know, and even if we could, and I know that that's a long you know, a long shot. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I worry about is, well, what about the people in Guatemala who can't right. afford the vaccine? That's right. What about the people in Tanzania whose government says that this virus doesn't exist? If those, if those populations are still a breathing ground for this virus, then we're going to have mutated, you know, the mutated variants 2.0 or the yeah. 3.0. Yeah. And who knows what's going to happen at that time. And, you know, at that time, we're not protected. It doesn't matter if you vaccinate everyone in America. There's no wall tall enough to build to keep this virus away from us. Yeah, that that is that is one of my concerns. I I, I talked to a, this vi yeah, I mentioned the same virologist yesterday, and um, he had an interesting observation about this illness. It, it, I've never seen smallpox, but he had seen hundreds and hundreds of cases, and he said, you know, thinking about this as a respiratory illness misses the point a little bit because it's so systemic. And he was saying in his sort of clinical sense, it was closer to smallpox than the average respiratory virus. Yeah, I don't think this is a normal respiratory virus. And I've been saying that from day one. It just isn't acting like a normal. And, and I myself had, I've had flu several times and I've had H1N1. Mm -hmm. um, and this is taking care of these patients. It's far different. It, I think of it as a Trojan horse. So yes, it comes in as a respiratory virus. But then the second phase, it turns into this autoimmune disorder. Yeah. And that's what's really killing a lot of patients in the hospital and causing a lot of problems with the long haulers and even the kids who get the multi-system inflammatory disease. Hmm. It's from the autoimmune process, the inflammatory process that this virus causes. And there's some microvascular something going on. And he was saying that particularly was very much like uh, smallpox. Yes, I, I don't think that you can compare this to any other respiratory virus. It's, right. it's far more devastating. And, and it, in that sense that it's, again, polysystem, inflammatory, microvasculature, it, it's not a flu either, except in the setting of secondary sepsis or something, right? Yeah, I mean, they can definitely cause, you know, flu-like symptoms, and it can definitely cause rapidly progressive respiratory failure. Mm -hmm. But no, it, it, the footprint's is just too large for it to be a simple respiratory virus. Mm -hmm. It does too many things to too many organs and the spectrum of what it causes is too far, too great for it to just to be a simple respiratory virus. What are your thoughts on whether there can be transmission after let's say a moderate to severe case or a good, you know, full vaccine series? Can people I think obviously transmit it? the data is still out there for yeah. whether you can get vaccinated and develop it and get infected and pass it on. I think that's going to be something that's going to get answered in the next three months. I think, you know, I wouldn't put anything past this virus um, because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't uh, follow the norms that we think of. So wait, I think explain it's that again. Wait, 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 wait. So the thought is that at, there's two different categories here. One is vaccine and we, and we don't have information that tells us the virus couldn't be transmitted after you've been thoroughly vaccinated. 
And we have to remember that most of the vaccine endpoints were either severe illness or moderate illness, but not any infection, right? We didn't really look at that, right? Is that true, Dr. Yadigar? Yeah, so Susan, yeah. first of all, the vaccine doesn't protect you. It's, it's at best, it's 94 to 95%. So mm -hmm. yes, you can still get the vaccine. And we have, I've, and I have patients that have had the series, even their second shot, even two weeks later, who have developed the infection. But the other part, which is more troubling, isn't that you can get the infection, but the other part is, can you get the vaccine and then get the disease and not really have a lot of symptoms, but right. transmit the disease, uh, right? Yeah. Which, because, which would be we more alarming. We really didn't study that. It's is not that really... the same as if you get the COVID, you well, can still the, transmit that's it? That's the other question. So that's the next population. So I've got, I've got enough antibody to cause an inflammatory reaction. Do I have enough antibody to prevent the virus? And by the way, I've had my antibody tested. It's 100% neutralizing antibodies. Does that mean I can't get infected and transmit it? <laughs> what? Well, I, I would hope that at least against the UK variant and the normal variant that yeah. you should have some protection. But right. who knows against the Brazilian and the South Africa? That, that's what I said. That's, I, I don't want those two. We believe still me. have to keep jamming things up our nose every time we fly. Right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, I don't care. Go ahead. Have at it. I I wanted to be the asymptomatic carrier. Yeah, we're telling Maybe people, you know, uh, nasopharyngeal oral lavage is a, you know, an addition to mask wearing. You know, I'm I'm adding everything I possibly can in. Does that mean halidine? Halidine, I mean, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I think for flights, and I've been telling my patient population for several years that when they fly, to make sure that their mucous membranes stay moist because mm -hmm. that's the first, you know, uh, therapy, first defense of, against any virus, any respiratory virus. So once that dries up, once your nasal passage dries up, it makes it much easier for the virus to really get in and you know infect the cells. And and there's mm. some good evidence that xylitol and uh, poviodine and other things can really be very helpful. So uh, I'm I'm advocating. I I'm had gonna, to I'm slow your roll. That. It's hard to understand what you guys are saying. Halidine. Yeah, I know okay. you're good though. But now I have a a question. Say okay. you do get the Pfizer vaccine and the new strains come out, which booster do you get after that? They're, they haven't come up with a booster yet, although right. they are developing it. The good thing about the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine and the fact that they're engineered is that they can actually rapidly alter the vaccine. So within a two to three week form, they can come up with a different variation of booster. And, um, it could be mass produced in terms of millions and millions of doses, uh, hundreds of millions of doses within a month. Mm -hmm. wow. So it is entirely possible. I wouldn't be surprised if in the next three to six months that there will be a booster for Moderna uh, as well as for Pfizer that would be responsive to the South African or the Brazil or maybe even to both. The kind of interesting question is, could you use an mRNA booster after the Johnson & Johnson or Novavax vaccines? I would think it's possible. I, yeah. I don't see why you wouldn't, because right. again, you know, with the first one, if you get a if you get a antibodies and if you get you know the proper therapy, um, why wouldn't the second one a booster work? Yeah, I, I would think so. It seems it seems like a good. But I, I so I'm what I'm doing personally is I'm watching my. I, I don't want to get another. I don't want to get sick again. So I'm worried that if I take the vaccine before my antibodies start to wane a little bit, I'm, I'm setting myself up for something. So I'm monitoring my antibodies, and once they get down, you know, maybe half of where they are now, something like that. Again, how, how far down, I, I don't know. But now they're just so crazy high, it worries me to take the vaccine. Plus, I don't want to take the vaccine from somebody who needs it. So um, probably be a few months, and then I'll take the vaccine. Uh, did you take one? Yes, um, I, I had the series. It was At the time, it was only the Pfizer that had been approved. Mm -hmm. um, and we had plenty of doctors and nurses, unfortunately, who who developed the disease between the first and their second shot. Oh gosh! Mm. And uh, plenty of the doctors who had the vac who had the disease even before their first shot. And if you had the disease and you got the first shot, you you definitely had a response to it. Yeah. And a lot of them felt like they had the disease all over again for a day or two. Ugh. And, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, it's just all. Yeah, so Microfish think, 4 has a question, but will the booster be approved by health departments? By health departments. They're not the ones that uh, do the approving. So well, who's the we, approver? We have to get, who who the, approves? The FDA. the FDA has to, and, and, the, FDA the, and the CDC has to approve. 
But will they be free or on your insurance? I mean, it's oh, like, yeah. I oh think that'll God. be all part of the. It seems like yeah. it's never going to end. <laughs> well, that's maybe we, uh, that's an interesting way of um, framing this conversation because it probably, I mean, it's, it's going it's <laughs> to. Don't gonna shake end. your head. The pandemic, the <laughs> pandemic is going to end, but I don't know that coronavirus is going to end. You know, I think it may be with us. Yeah. Yeah, I think at this point, the idea that we're going to get rid of this virus and it's no longer going to be on the face of this planet is right. probably very unlikely. Right. It's more likely that we're going to be able to have vaccines and maybe some other therapies and try to live with it. And it'll just be, a, you know, hopefully it'll just be as bad as the flu and maybe even less if we can get it there. Right. And it will and it will mutate once in a while and come around and kick our ass a little bit. Then we'll mm. come up with another booster and then we'll come up and we'll have good therapeutics at that point. And so hopefully hopefully we can, you know, stay ahead of it. But it is a bit of a race. Right? Yeah, I think again, from my standpoint, and I know that you're connected to higher people, Dr. Drew, but I don't understand why Merck, why other other pharmaceutical companies aren't making this vaccine at this point. I don't understand why it's only Pfizer and Moderna. It should be, you know, every every pharmaceutical company that can make this vaccine should be making this vaccine. And we should get not only everyone in America, but everyone on the face of the planet to get vaccinated as soon as possible. I, because I, I think I think AstraZeneca was supposed to be that vaccine because they they wanted something cheap and and easy to produce and they, that i was hearing a lot of buzz about you know other countries you know le want you know preparing to get that astrazeneca vaccine because they couldn't afford other ones and that's sort of been a disappointment yeah because i think again the, the longer this this vaccine is around the longer it's infecting people and replicating and because it's, it's such an imperfect replication yeah it's just a higher chance that you're going to get another mutated variant yeah I, I kind of feel like they should put the AstraZeneca out there and just get what they can out of it, you know? So it's 60% effective. So let's just, let's just start distributing it. Then maybe on the heels of that, we can get something more effective on top of it. But even if it's 60% effective, well, that's six, you know, six out of right. 10 people that's who right. the virus is not going to infect and is not going to have a chance to replicate in. Or at least the more it replicates, the, yeah, the more right. it replicates, the more mutations that you're going to get. <laughs> I, I agree. I'm still trying to wrap my head around this carrying the the virus, even if you've had the vaccination. And how did they figure this out? Did they give COVID tests to everybody and then they just had the virus in their nose, like no, no, a rapid no, no. test? They, or? They, they didn't test for that. That's the point. They tested. What they looked at was how many people got severe illness, how many people got moderate illness. That's it. No, I mean, how are you still a carrier after you have the vaccination? You just get you, a moderate cold, but you get mild or asymptomatic. But are you going to test positive for COVID? Because you know how yes. we're yep. getting tested. To yeah, get I would for say. COVID? I would say you. Yes, I would say you would. You have to show that you have a positive test. Well, to be, a, to be able to, because like you were sick for five days and you had COVID and it didn't test positive. Interesting question. What do you, what do you say to that, Dr. Yadigar? Um, I think that you would test positive eventually um, if there's enough of a viral load. Uh, but she's asking, could, she's asking, could you be infectious before you tested positive? And I don't know. How did they? It's a, yes. it's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I yes, mean, Drew is, was, uh, was having a fever for three or four days. And I didn't, you know, we were doing rapid tests and PRKs or whatever they're PCRs. called. PCRs. PCRs and, and nothing showed yes, positive. But, Yes, I mean, there's definitely a period where you are contagious, you may be asymptomatic, and you could test negative. Uh, that's definitely well known. And um, most people are probably most symptom, most contagious a day or two before they even start having symptoms. Oh my God. And it's, it's not unusual for you once you even start to having symptoms for you not to be able oh to test God. positive for a few don't, days later. Don't tell the networks this. We <laughs> Right. That's well, why I you're... think it's important. I think it's important for people to recognize that, though. Yeah. Because, no, it you know, is. No, it Susan, is. It's true. why you're being tested. No, it's I why... understand. Now I, I get I, it. I still think I. I believe Dr. Yadigar. Okay. Yeah. I totally believe him. I still think I'm one of the safest people in America right now in terms of having this illness. But but even I, as Dr. Yadigar pointed out, I could get one of these variants, and that that's actually scary to me. That right. So our son's driving across the country right now, and he could come back with it. I mean, he's being careful. You know what I mean? But he being, he had it for like a week and then he was fine. He's not he's not throwing caution to the wind. I mean, everybody is still 
behaving themselves and doing right. What he wears to do. a mask and yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess I think, I think the good thing is that you know the government is doing more genomic testing. We weren't doing enough of it, and yeah. we're just falling asleep at the wheel. But now they have stepped it up, so hopefully we'll know, you know, if the variants are around where right. they are, That's and then right. hopefully that that can you know help us in terms of how we you know plan ahead. So so let me shine a little light on that, Susan. What he's saying is that we were not testing the genetic makeup of the viruses around the country. England was doing a very good job of that, and they were detecting stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not doing much of that. Now we're doing it, and we're going to be able to see if we got variants. And we're turning up new variants. Actually, California had a little new variant show up that hadn't been seen anywhere else, if I remember right. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. uh, California does have a, a new variant. It's yeah. uh, more transmissible, and I think also... From what we saw in December and January, it, there's no doubt that it's also more lethal, um, especially the patients that went on a ventilator. We had very little chance of getting any of those patients off a ventilator, which was not the case in early on in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, uh, have we missed anything? Is there anything else you're thinking about you want to discuss? Any other topics that we uh, didn't sort of survey past? No, I mean, I think the thing that's... Um, Frustrating is still that we you know we're not treating the COVID uh, you know induced cytokine storm as aggressively in, mm. in all institutions. I think there's still you know a reluctance to treat with increasing steroids, and unfortunately the IL-6 inhibitors haven't really gotten their fair um, you know day in the sun. Mm. And I'm hoping that the UK study that came out last month and is undergoing peer review um, will hopefully change a lot of that because again, we've been doing that for the past 11 months and I see the results on a daily basis. It weren't they combining toxaluzumab with something at one point? Was it an anti It was steroids. Just steroids. It was a lot okay. of, yeah. a lot of those patients were on steroids yeah. because it was, it was done in the summertime and that's when the yeah. steroid, um, you know, benefits had come out in the study. Well, in the meantime, we hope the vaccine does uh, as much as possible. Let's put it that way. And everyone needs to get that damn vaccine. I, uh, I think this is um, a race presently. And uh, it would be very... The, the other sad part to me is not just uh, the lack of willingness to get aggressive on the cytokine storm. It's also a lack of willingness to treat people in the outpatient setting when we can do things to prevent hospitalization. That, that's very frustrating to me. So. Yes, I mean, I think the earlier we can treat patients, the better the outcomes are going to be. That's that's clear. Seems to be. Well, Dr. Gadigar, thank you for joining me again. As always, we appreciate you coming in and giving us an update on what you guys are doing. And uh, I, I I suspect this won't be our last conversation, but um, I feel like this one is a little more um, like we have it in hand a bit compared to before. Before we were in the middle of the fog of war, now I feel like we have a... a, a uh, what would you call it a, a a plan a plan of attack and and, uh, and we've got the uh, the enemy on the run a bit but it's still a, a quite a quite a monumental effort dr yadigar has been working hard <laughs> oh no kidding it's always a pleasure being with you dr drew and um i would i would concur that we have learned a lot but um it's no time to put our guards down this right. virus is incredibly tricky and um, I know it's it's taken too many Angelinos, too many Americans, and too many yeah. people across the across the globe. So we need to stay vigilant. Agreed. Thank you so much, sir. That's Dr. Thank you. Thomas Yadigar. I will give you his uh, particulars once again. Whoop! I lost it here. Uh, <laughs> one second. He's a doctor. He is a doctor, pulmonologist, director of intensive care at Cedars <laughs> Pro Providence Tarzana Hospital. And again, uh, improving mortality with these newer technologies that he has been embracing. Uh, there we go. So looking back at, um, uh, your guys. Lots of good comments. Uh, yes, lots of good comments. Let me get, let me get uh, to I'm going to get here. some education on Twitch on how to, how to get a super chat something or other from our fans. Okay. We're looking at your guys' comments before we wrap things up. Let me see if we have any data coming in from today yet. Uh, I believe things are, certainly in California, they are a bit better. Uh, let me just look at some of the things. Sure here. to uh, go over to Locals and sign up, and when we go live, you'll get a notification. Oh, you you don't go have, we're going live tonight? No, when we go live, ah, for this. you'll get Got an it. email, and you know you don't have to pay, but if you want to join, you'll support the show, and it's $7 a month. Is today February 9th? Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm not seeing the 9th on the... Uh, Oh, this maybe has the ninth on there. Let's see. 
And then we also have yes. Michaela Peterson tomorrow, I think. Although she just sent me an email. Let me see what that says. She just doesn't want to, you know, she just wants to be careful. Don't tell everybody. Uh, so I think she's canceling tomorrow. What? Looks like it. Well, Maybe. You always say that. Would you well, it forward it to me? Okay. All right. Well, then maybe we'll have to have uh, we'll we'll call um, Alex Michelson. Okay. Let me just. I just sent her uh, a response, and I will forward. Can it I see it you. first before you yes, do that? Yes. 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 Well, maybe Alex will come on because I have him for next week, and I'm okay. Sure. I wanted to have him last week, but you were not feeling up to it, so we had to cancel him. All right. Uh, looking at your guys' comments here. Yes, I have high blood pressure, Sandy. I do. I also have hypercholesterolemia, so that puts me, and I'm, you know, in a risk age. Uh, so that these are the people that get into trouble with this thing. Yes. But that was a nice chat with him. He's. It's so funny because when we first started talking to him right at the beginning of the whole pandemic, mm -hmm. like in February or March of last year, mm -hmm. he was like, you know, the super nerdy doctor that we went to and he was you know he's on top of it but it's he's he's very well trained he looks a lot younger than he is <laughs> you know he's got a lot of a lot of education behind him but shane on the additic score i'm hearing they will be able to get i had an update this morning you'll be able to get an additic score through going through a certain group of professionals physicians i'm going to get that list and then in a several weeks down the line there'll be some direct access for the average person without without a professional in between. So I'm, I'm going to keep an eye on that. Um, right now they're just ramping up their capacity to be able to handle all that when they when the general public gets involved. Will the pandemic ever end? Yes, it will. The oh pandemic will end. The virus may stick around, but the pandemic will end. Mm. I just wonder if like all those viruses that were flying around last year in December and January were somehow connected to this somehow. Because there were there were some those were stuff. but those were respiratory viruses to be fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's let's kind of wrap things up here. As I after about an hour, I kind of ran out of steam. So oh, <laughs> uh, interesting. John Campbell had a good view. New New Forest Pony says, Doctor Campbell had a good video today about reinfection myth busting. That sounds interesting. Oh I'll, really? I will look at that. Yep. Oh, Doctor Campbell. It's a, the nurse, John Campbell. Yeah, but that's the question. Like, you know, they're saying, we don't know, we don't know, but we think. So you should, you know, be careful. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be everybody who's had the vaccine is going to become a carrier. No, that doesn't mean that at all. In, in fact, it may be very, very rare. It's just that we don't know yet. But you could be. Well, we, we looked at the, we didn't look at endpoints. See, the studies were done. Studies are done with particular endpoints, right? You know, how many people in the placebo group versus how many people in, in the treatment group got sick. Now, you, now you, you're now you trying to do this quickly, so you have to decide, well, do we want to call getting sick being hospitalized, dying, getting moderate illness by certain criteria? In most vaccines, they just they, they qualified it as preventing severe illness and hospitalization. But I believe in a Johnson & Johnson, they're also looking at moderate COVID, which I, I like that, that they're also looking at that. So, again, we will, because um, moderate COVID is no fun, I assure you. All right, let's kind of wrap things up. I, I was not clear. Did you get that email, Susan, I sent forwarded to you? No, I'm still working on the show here. So, I'm yeah. gonna, so I, it's I, just, I, come on, let's not talk about it, okay? She may not be here tomorrow. So right, we're not I'm not sure. going to, I was getting, I had my hopes up. All right, so anyways, I want to mention really quick, we're having a benefit for our foster children in Pasadena, California, and it'll be a fun event. You might want to join. Go to hillsides.ejoinme slash Raising Hope 2021. This is a, a an organization that's very dear and near to me and Drew, and we'll be a part of it, and hopefully we'll see you there. There'll be some really great auction items, and we're trying to uh, keep this boat afloat in Pasadena. Excellent. And uh, I will see you one way or another tomorrow afternoon around this time. Ooh, yay. Mm -hmm. As we're gradually moving back to opening schools and businesses and, of course, our in-person interactions, I want to remind you, this is all time with cold and flu season getting going. Staying hydrated is key to helping your body deal with the added stress and with the upcoming flu season. My regular fans have heard me talk about a product called Hydrite for a long time now. 
an amazing rapid rehydration drink. It's a mix that, well, we're obsessed with here. I'm excited to announce they've just released Hydrolyte Plus Immunity, just in time for cold and flu season. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity starts with their fast-absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of immune-boosting ingredients. Each single-serve, easy-pour drink mix contains 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C and 300 milligrams of elderberry extract, creates what is hopefully immune-boosting formula that's high in antioxidants and zinc. Combining this with Hydrolyte's seven key electrolytes, it's a fantastic way to stay proactive and properly hydrated. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity comes in convenient, easy-to-pour powder sticks that rapidly dissolve in water and make a great tasting drink that has 75% less sugar than your typical sports drink. It uses all natural flavors and it is gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and it is vegan. And you can find Hydrolyte Plus by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that's H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-W. And be sure to use our code Dr. Drew 25 at checkout for a special discount. Well, I too have struggled with GI issues over the years. I have something called Lynch syndrome. So gut health is extremely important to me. And while gut health awareness has increased, it's led to a wellness trend that's inspired a host of questionable marketing and some false claims. Now you've seen the word probiotic attached to all kinds of supplements, drinks, even more. They may claim to deliver the healthy microorganisms our gut needs for proper function, but all too often the promises are in fact too good to be true. Thankfully, I became aware of a company called Seed and their flagship product, the Daily Symbiotic. Seed's Daily Symbiotic offers 24 clinically researched strains of microorganisms in a single dose. These strains support gut health and can improve regularity and relieve bloating, sometimes within as little as 24 to 48 hours. To me, what really sets Seed's Daily Symbiotic apart is the delivery system. While some products may offer the right strains, they're fragile, they rarely survive the trip through the gut, doesn't get where it needs to go, but Seed uses a capsule in capsule design that helps ensure the probiotic reaches your colon, which is where they often are needed. I have been taking Seed's Daily Symbiotic, and I really encourage you to check out their story and the science behind what they do. To try it for yourself, just go to seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew20 for 15% off your first month of Daily Symbiotic. That is S E E D.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew20.